guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be doing one last stack exercise from Protostar. We're going to be doing stack 6. Now, that's, the reason we're not going to be doing stack 7 in this one is just because stack 7 is literally a repeat of stack 6. Um, at least our exploit will work for either one. The general concept is exactly the same. In fact, stack 6 is uh, much too similar to the previous ones as well. Um, but we're going to go ahead and do this one just because it's kind of interesting um, in terms of the way you can sort of sidestep some things it has there. So here is the about uh, for stack 6. It looks at what happens when you have restrictions on the return address. This level can be done in a couple of ways, such as finding the duplicate of the payload, uh, return to libc, or even return-oriented programming. It is strongly suggested you experiment with multiple ways of getting your code to execute here. The level is here. So, um, yeah, one thing I want to note here, we're not going to be doing return-oriented programming for this. It's just not, it's not uh, worth the time and effort to go searching for all the gadgets. If you saw my previous video, uh, you saw how we had to manually look for some, uh, just even a pop uh, return. Uh, for this one, to build your own shellcode, you need a couple of very specific gadgets that pop into specific registers, do arithmetic on specific registers, and that simply takes too much time without a program to help us. Uh, but what we're going to be doing here is kind of like that. And you'll see um, we're, we're going to be still executing from the stack, but the way that we return is reminiscent of ROP. So here's our source code. Um, we have a git path function here that's called by main. Uh, there's a buffer here of size 64, which of course we call with gits, or we uh, fill with gits, and then uh, there's a return variable here that uh, is allocated. Uh, the return is actually set to the return address after gits buffer is uh, called, or gits is called. So notice that when we overflow the buffer here, uh, we obviously are going to be affecting the return address, and this return will reflect that. So here it says, well, it's going to check if the return bitwise end with BF000000 is equal to BF000000. And if you can really think about what this does here, if you look at our previous exploits, we've all been using BFs, uh, things that begin with BFs, um, as our return address, because that is a location on the stack that contains executable shellcode. Now, there's nothing in here that says the stack isn't executable, so that method is still not out of the window completely, but we just can't return there at first. So we have to build a stack, essentially, that kind of bypasses this. So let's get down to it. So here is the general concept. We have a buffer here, obviously, and we're still going to be putting our shellcode at the bottom of this buffer here. So, yeah, so this is our shellcode, um, and as we know from before, it's going to be 28 bytes. We're just going to use a very standard one here. And above that, we're going to have the knob sled. Knob slide, whatever you want to call it. And, of course, halfway through, we're going to make a mark and say sometime we've got to return to there. This not sled clearly has to be 36 bytes because our buffer, keep in mind, is 64. Ooh. So there's going to be some padding here between the buffer and the saved EBP, of course. And we have to find how much that is exactly. And then we're going to have the saved EBP and then a return address. Uh, obviously, this is the x86 stack layout uh, with higher addresses at the bottom and the stack growing up. So how are we going to do this? So we overwrote this with shellcode, we overwrote this with knob. What we're going to end up doing, of course, is uh, overwriting the saved EBP with uh, B characters and then we're going to overwrite this padding here with A characters. Okay, but what about this return address? Clearly, we can't return back into the stack because the stack will have BF as its highest byte. That will be basically killed by our program here, which will print this and then exit. So we can't do that. Another idea is to return back into our program, into the text area. 
uh, and this will work very nicely. As you can see, get path will have a return instruction, and if we can just put that return instruction here, I'm going to just call it return at get path. I'm just going to call it GP for short. What will happen is there will be a return, and it will simply return again, returning again to the address below this. Now this is uh, some other value of the stack, probably the return address for main, actually. I don't know, you'd have to look at the, uh, the layout of the stack there. But, um, but in any case, we can overwrite this one with our uh, middle of not. And essentially this will cause a return or jump to here, this point there. Uh, and then we can still get to our shellcode, just like that. So essentially, we're just returning and returning to another address. So in a way, you could say that this return here is a gadget. In fact, it is technically a gadget because it is a, an instruction sequence, and it, it is an, exec, um, an executable instruction sequence uh, that's not on the stack, as we'll see, because this is a text area. Um, and it causes a, basically, after it's done, it moves on to the next quote-unquote gadget. But this time, this one here is not a gadget because it's, it's a, um, it jumps into the stack, which you can't really do uh, if the stack were not executable. Okay, so all that is left to do is find how many A's we have to write here. And then find the two addresses that we need to return to. And we can do that easily with GDB. Okay, so we'll run GDB and set stack 6. Set our disassembly flavor to Intel. And then uh, break at main. We'll run it. Okay, then we'll disassemble our interesting function here, which is get path. Okay, so the first thing we could do is really get the size of that buffer. Or not buffer, that padding. So the way we can do that is just looking at uh, where our buffer actually starts. So just as we've done before, we can go here and see that they've allocated 64 bytes for the buffer at the beginning here, and there's a call with gets on buffer. Now whenever uh, this happens, the buffer address has to be placed on the stack. So we can look at the call to gets here and see what's pushed on the stack before. Here's the call to gets. And just before that, there is a move of EAX into the ESP. This is kind of like a push. And EAX is the same as EBP minus hex 4C. So that means that the buffer has to be located at EBP minus hex 4C. This is EBP minus hex 4C. Okay, great, but we know that the buffer is of size 64, and 4C is 76, uh, I believe. Yeah, because 4, 16, 64, plus 12, there is 76. So the size of the A padding here that we're going to have to do is simply 76 minus 64, which is 12 bytes of A's. Of course, we're going to do 4 bytes of B's because this is just one entry, one word, on our 32-bit machine stack. And then this return a GP and this we have to find next. So the way we do that um, is just simply break. And then we'll find out, uh, we'll find out the return address of GP. Actually, why did we do that? In fact, G, uh, no. Um, in this case, we have a return here and we already know the return is here. So it's 080484F9. Zero eight zero four eighty four F nine. So that is the return at GP and then the mid of NOPS. Okay. So for this one, we're looking for this address here, but this one depends on EBP. Let's figure out what this is relative to EBP. So we know that we have 36 bytes of knobs and we're landing halfway. So that means that there's 18, it's 18 bytes above the beginning of this. 
So just doing a little bit of math here, we can do EBP minus hex 4C, which is the beginning of the buffer, and then we're going to add halfway through the knobs. I'm going to add this. And 18 in hexadecimal is 1, 2. So what we're looking for down here is EBP uh, minus hex 3A. Okay, so we have to find EBP after it is pointing here. And then the way we can do this is, yes, we have to set a breakpoint after it is stable. So at this point, it should be stable after EBP, ESP is moved there. It doesn't change for the rest of the procedure till the end. We'll continue this, and then we'll look at the registers to see what we get. EBP is equal to this thing here. So, uh, yeah, so that's EBP. And we have to now subtract 3a from this. And to do this, you can just uh, use any online uh, calculator. Uh, and you'll see the result BFFFF76E. Okay, so this is all we need. Then our shell code will just come from here, just the one that we've been using before, just a very simple one. And yeah, so that should work. Um, let's go ahead and write our exploit. Uh, so we'll quit, yes. So we'll change directories into temp, and then we'll take a look at we'll vim stack six exploit Python script. Okay, so we have our knob slide, which is the 90, 90 multiplied by 36, followed by our shell code. So our shell code will just copy from here. Okay, and then we have to get rid of all this annoying stuff here. Okay, perfect. Um, after this, we're going to uh, pad. So our A is, remember, times 12, plus B is to fill up the saved EDP. Remember, I'll pull up the drawing here. And then we're going to write these values in little Indian. So F9840408. Okay, and then we'll return to, in fact, it's probably better to use double quotes here, not that it matters. Oops. 6E, F7, and so on. Okay. All right, so then we'll craft our payload. Okay, then our, we'll just print the payload like that, and then we are good. So let's Python this um, into an exploit file here and just see what we have. So yeah, this is what we expect to see. We had the bin sh here. Okay, and I want to bring this here, this these ages here, actually, this is kind of interesting. Uh, I'm pretty sure in hexadecimal, they represent the uh, pushes that will push these values onto the stack, the bin and sh strings here. And then the and then the system call will come after that. So that, I just thought that would be kind of interesting there. Now let's actually see this in action. OK, 
Okay. Now let's just see who I am. I am root now. Okay, let's look at the files. Okay, well, let's see what else we have here. Great, we have all this stuff. Let's look at our uh, home. Huh, what is remaster sys? Huh, nothing there. Let's run bash. Yeah, then we get this kind of thing here, of course. All right, yeah, and then we we get exit out of that. So yeah, um, that was it for our uh, stack six exploit. Stack seven is just identical to this, essentially. I don't know if it will still work the same way. Yeah, you'll have to change the addresses because they'll be a little bit different, probably. Um, that's causing the segmentation fault here. Uh, but the exploit is basically the same. So yeah, that is it for Protostar stack exploits. Uh, in the next uh, few videos, we're going to be looking at format uh, string exploits, which are actually quite interesting. So yeah, uh, see if you can find some other uh, CTFs online or something that will use uh, stack buffer overflow. They're pretty fun, pretty easy to understand as long as you understand the stack structure. So yeah, it was a pleasure, and I will see you in the format exploits.